if you're a fan of safe Swedish estates, then you're in the right place because today we're driving an Amazon estate. Come along for the ride. If you're liking this kind of thing, then do hit the subscribe button because that makes a massive difference to the channel. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today we are once again driving an estate car. Now, when you hear the word estate or the word Volvo, you tend to think of one and the other. They're kind of interchangeable these days, but that doesn't actually go back to the 200 or even the 100 series. That Volvo estateiness really started with this, the Amazon. Now, known to the public as the 121, there's even a badge on the front wing saying so. Internally, it was based on the P120 series, which, given the big old lump on the back of the car, it became the P220 series. Now, as a saloon, the Amazon have been around since 1956. It took a while for them to bolt a big old box on the back, and it became an estate in 1962, when it was launched at the Stockholm Motor Show. Now, styling-wise, the Amazon moved Volvo cars on quite significantly in the way the cars looked and the appeal they had around Europe and the rest of the world. You've probably heard the name Jan Wilsgaard before. He was Volvo's designer from around 1700 until the year 3000, I believe. Um, he was responsible for everything, really. The 200, the 100 series, the 700 series, the 900 series, right up until the millennium, pretty much. Everything had his hand in it. Now, looking at this car, this has got Italian, British, and very strong American influences in the styling. You can look at this and see the Chrysler 300 series and New Yorker series from the 50s very strongly. Jan Wilsgott actually said he saw a Kaiser in uh, Gothenburg docks and that gave him a strong influence as well. Personally I can see a fair bit of Studebaker in there too. But this new global design influence did give the car much stronger international appeal so it became one of Volvo's first big international sellers. And then as you look at some of the details, the shape of these lights on the top of this wing, these wraparound indicators, even the little spotlights, you can see these moving into the square or later cars from the 60s into the 70s. This car's design language did transfer and evolve into the later Volvos. Now as we are talking today about the estate rather than the saloon, let's come around the back and talk about this area. Now first of all, the side styling is much the same. We've got the same lovely curvy looks. Volvo is thought of as a very square looking car, but these things are curves all over the place. They were rivaling things like the Rovers, the P4 and P5, which are all curves all over the place in American style as well. The Saabs of the time were all very much jelly mold looking things. So this was also that same look of curves everywhere. And this long lateral curving line does carry on all the way to an abrupt end. Here are these little sticky out lights, which I think are the same lamp units as you'd find on the uh, saloon, just slightly further forward. Now this is a really clever back end on this car. This tailgate is all over the place and ingenious. If you've watched much Nordic Noir, then you'll know how ingenious those clever Swedes can be. And if they want to dispose of a body, they are well sorted because not only does this open like this, so you can open just the top half. So if you need something quickly disposed of quickly in the back, then you can just throw it in there and then shut the top. Or if you need to do a big load, you can open that as well. And so you can bundle things easily into the back should you need to. It can also, this doesn't latch down I should say, but it will close down. So if you need long, very long loads, because the Swedes are tall people. Um, this is quite a long boot nonetheless. We've got someone who's like an eight footer, stretched out in rigor mortis and so forth, sticking all the way out the back. You can close the top half and call it a Christmas tree. There are a couple of other clever items as well. If you are not the bundler, but the bundlee, there's a button to get out of the boot on the inside of the tailgate. So uh, if your unwilling victim does come to, they can get out. So maybe not the best kidnapper's car. Also underneath here, like the early minis and the original Range Rovers. Do you remember when the Range Rover was a practical car for farmers to use as a bit more comfortable than the basic Land Rover and not a fashion statement? They had a fold down number plate, so your number plate could still be seen when you're driving with big heavy loads in the back. Now the load space in here is absolutely enormous. Hello, oh, oh, echo, oh. I think I can see a Yeti in the distance. It goes on forever and the rear seats fold down as well. So if you're a late 50s or 1960s uh, antique dealer, this would be the perfect car for you. Now the Amazon estate was actually built alongside the P210 Duet. But according to Volvo themselves, that was more of a car derived van than an estate car. This is where Volvo really stepped into the wagon market. Oh, that's heavy. Another really clever, useful thing in the back of here, not only do you have this great tailgate for, you know, load lugging, long load, sitting on the, having a picnic on, you've also, if you have a roof rack on here, got the option to stand on these big useful treads and put things up on the roof. This thing is brilliant. So practical. Right, so let's look at the engine now and check this out. 
spring-loaded cantilevery clever hinges so no messing around the bonnet prop this thing goes straight up and stays there brilliant now across the uh, saloon and estate P120 and P220 ranges there are basically three engines used or four at a push there was the B16 which is the 1.6 the B18 which is the 1.8 or what 1778cc and finally the legendary B20 with power outputs ranging between 70, 90 and 95 horsepower. Now this particular car has a B18A and it's a 1968 car, so this is quite a late one, which I think made 90 horsepower or 95 when it was new. However, that's no longer relevant. This car has been very heavily breathed over by the previous owner who's had it for the last 16 years and has clearly spent a lot of time and effort making it the best they can. Looking at the suspension underneath, it's got the fattest anti-roll bar you've ever seen. So this rolls far less in corners than you expect. Now looking under this engine, okay there's a few obvious things like the big air filters are a bit of a giveaway but those are attached to a pair of hs6 1.75 inch carburetors it's got a lightened flywheel it's got a simonized sports four branch exhaust manifold going into a sports exhaust it's got an upgraded camshaft and there's a gas flowed stage two cylinder head with new valves and springs in it there are lightened push rods and lightened cam followers so it's much less rotating mass or moving mass and there are steel timing gears so it won't slip out of time like a plastic one would and you might also notice just here is a brake servo that wasn't standard when new that's uh, a bit of an upgrade too so this thing actually stops as well as it goes it's only done about 3,000 miles since it was all upgraded it's the perfect daily driver for someone who wants a practical useful easy running daily classic fantastic and in terms of maintenance and stuff so easy to work on you can get around this big old red block no problem there's tons of space in here lots of room for activities now climbing in is actually a little harder than you might think because the roof line is quite low and this huge steering wheel does really come close to the seat squab so trying to squeeze your legs underneath the rim of the wheel is surprisingly tricky but once you're in it's really quite comfortable and uh, you can get yourself really well sorted in a nice driving position we'll talk about that on the road more but first of all let's talk about all of the interior and just look at these amazing seats this this kind of orangey caramel color is just astonishing i love it i've recently i was looking at a volvo v70 a fairly new one uh, for sale and if it wasn't for the tax bracket it was in i would have had it like a shot and it had leather in virtually this exactly same color and it was oh, fantastic right let's get you off for your tripod and show you around the interior now, first of all, before you even climb in, you notice these beautiful embossed aluminium kick plates with the Volvo uh, logo here in them. And secondly, you'll notice the outboard uh, handbrake. This is because a bench seat was an option that was talked about in some of the early cars. And finally, you'll see this little switch here. This is the uh, little movement toggle for moving the seat back and forth on the outside, interestingly, rather than in front. And being a Volvo, safety and comfort is important, so you can uh, recline the seat as well. Let's climb in properly now. Oh, one more thing. Down in the carpet we've got the Amazon uh, emblazoned foot pad by the pedals. I don't know if that's standard. I think it's had new carpets in this car. That may be an, an aftermarket thing, but I don't know. It looks good nonetheless. Now, let's look at this door as we shut it. First of all, this door top is a metal door cap, as they often were in the 1950s and into the 60s. But look how it just curves around, so this shape marries up to the shape of the dashboard. That's quite an interesting little bit of door architecture just there. I'm, I'm very impressed with that. I've got big door handles, pull down to open. This huge, easy to find window winder there as well. I love this same orangey, caramelly, I don't know what the hell you call it, colour vinyl door card and a useful door pocket as well uh, someone has put some speakers in here which are not necessary to my taste i mean if this is my car i think i might i don't know maybe i'll get some paint mixed up that was kind of a match to this and then take the grills off and paint them to to disguise it maybe just leave the black plastic trim and then paint the metal grill so it hides it a bit more and there's a useful just above that speaker a slightly squishy rubbery plasticky grip to yank it shut now, as well as the keep fit windows here in the door we also have these little quarter lights i do miss having quarter lights in cars this is something that air conditioning has really killed in modern cars because you just don't really need quarter lights with aircon but that's such a cool thing now moving into the dashboard a couple of features to talk about first of all there's body color metal door trim carries on in the lower half of the entire width of the dashboard I'm kind of surprised in, a, in a, such a safety conscious vehicle. Um, you've still got a metal lower dash. The top half is padded. This is uh, 
padded and ribbed for your safety. And on top of it, the previous owner has added a rev counter as well because that was uh, not included by Volvo originally. The uh, main instrument we do have is this wonderful strip type speedo. We'll be able to see that moving in a moment when we're on the road, but check out that font. That is just absolutely glorious. That lovely kind of 50s, I don't know, space agey, very Swedish font. And below that we just have a little small temperature gauge, a trip meter, overall distance covered, and fuel gauge. That's really our limit of our instruments and a couple of warning lights, headlights, ignition, that kind of thing, and of course choke. And below that then we have uh, half a dozen or so little switches and dials. They're kind of symmetrical down there. A marked toggle switch for something down here. One of these is the overdrive. Apparently this car has got four speed plus overdrive. Uh, we've got our wipers and our lights and ignition. On the right and on the left hand side, a choke. We should put that in now because it's quite warm. Cigar lighter, oops, and the fan. And another mystery toggle switch. One of those two toggle switches is the overdrive. And moving on into the center, we have got our fan controls. So we've got floor, and if you don't want floor, it's floor or not, I suppose. Um, this one is temperature, hot and cold written on there, and uh, deferral. So if you want to think about temperature later on, you slide that switch down and you can consider it at another time. A little, <coughs> wow, creaky out ashtray for your sweetie wrappers. And someone has added that there's radio. I think there was a radio in this position on the dashboard to start with, but obviously something far more period correct. This one looks like it joined the party in the 1980s, going by the styling of it. Radio cassette, it's got auto stop, so it's not all bad, and stereo. I'm not sure, no, it's not got FM, it's just medium wave and long wave, so this is clearly a fairly old elderly device. And a, and a grab handle, so if you're cornering hard because those Swedes like to, to drive hard, uh, your passenger can cling on there. But they don't necessarily need to cling on because this is quite an exciting thing in this car. Down here between the seats, first we've got our four speed manual, thank you very much indeed, we like that. Um, we've got these little toggles here, which may not seem exciting or unusual, but this is your seat belt. And there's only static belts in this car, here hanging from the uh, B posts. But these, whoops, but as Volvo will tell you ad infinitum, they were the first people to fit seat belts as standard. So, in 1959, Volvo were the first company to fit seat belts as standard to any car. And this is quite a big deal to have these things here in the car at all. So 1968, this is nearly a decade on from that, when they were becoming standard and mandatory in some places. But, but this car, not only Volvo, but this actual model of car is the one that started it all. If you want to talk about safe cars and estate cars, you're in the right place. Anyway, back to the, the look around the interior. Um, not much else to talk about on the passenger side. They have their seats, they have their seat belt, and they have their grab handle. There's not much else for the passenger to do. They can man the audio controls. We do have visors for both people in the front, which is uh, not necessarily a, a given in a car of this period. Uh, original headlining with that lovely kind of perforated stuff, and uh, just one little lamp for the, illuminating the entire car at night. Let's take a look in the back. Now, someone has added rear static seat belts to this car, adding a bit more safety. Uh, we've got the door cards, which are much the same as the front ones, but no speakers this time, and there is the addition of little ashtrays in the door cards. Getting in is much the same as it is in the front. And uh, we've got just frankly amazing headroom and really good legroom as well. This is tons of space. I mean, comparing this, by the late 60s, this was a rival for the Rover P6. And uh, I've got to say, I think there's far better uh, legroom in the back of this car than there is in the P6. And something else I've just noticed, on the front seats, which the P6 lacks as well, is both front seats have this uh, firmness softness adjuster dial, so you can really kind of fine tune your level of comfort. Although there is something the P6 has, which these two front seats don't. And again, I'm surprised for a safety orientated car, these aren't there. There's no headrests here. Now glancing back, we have this seat which folds forward, making this a massive load space area. And then the load space area itself is pretty voluminous. You can stick a lot of stuff in there. You're going for a camping trip or an antiquing expedition or murdering spree or whatever you want to do. Um, then you're sorted. This will take pretty much anything. Right. And away we go. Tiny bit of choke because the car's been sat for a while. There we have. Our original 1959 spec seatbelt, clicking into this unusual thing on the floor. Which does hinge a little bit, so a bit of, bit of flex and play. It's a static seatbelt. As I mentioned before, we've got our outboard of the seat. 
hand brake. And that was because there was, I believe, a bench seat, if not actually put in production, they were considering a bench seat, being you know, 1950s and American inspired. And so, yeah, they had two different gearbox options. Well, one was the four speed manual, which had an overdrive as an option. This car does have it. And then there was the uh, three speed auto, which had the option of a column shift. Very American. Oh, this brakes are sharp. Now, when I reviewed the Fiat Dino, whoops, it's a bit cold. When I reviewed the Fiat Dino, I turned left out of that car park and the lanes were horribly tiny, so I'm going to go right this time. Indicator on the right hand stalk. I mentioned the engine's been fairly well upgraded. 0 to 60 in a standard 1.8 V18. And 0 to 60 in a standard V18 1.8 was 14 and a half seconds. That's not rapid. This car does feel a fair bit brisker, I've got to be honest, with all the engine modifications. And thanks to the uh, underbody things you can't see, it's also quite a nice riding thing when the stance of this car is absolutely perfect. It's got uh, Operated Bill Stein suspension. It's got operated anti-roll bars. I don't know if it's been lowered at all, but it certainly has a nice stance on the road. It looks good in the car park. There's nothing behind us. And I can say, originally, these cars came with four unassisted drums as standard. Later on, they got front discs. This has now got power front discs, so I'm just gonna hit the brakes hard. Wow. That, uh, that comes up in a hurry. Now, can you see this speedometer rolling across the numbers? Isn't that cool? This does actually feel quite lively on the road. Apparently they're also considering a straight six and even a small V8 for this car. That didn't come to pass, obviously they stuck with the four cylinders. And this car is currently for sale at Percival Motors near Maidstone in Kent. And it's something I've got to be honest, I'm kind of tempted by myself. If you want to try and beat me to it, head to the link in the description and check out uh, their website. Now this roof line is surprising. Look, it looks very hot rodish with this low, uh, low, what do you call it? Uh, blah, 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 roof rail. It's something a lot of other cars, even things like the Jaguar XF, still do today. So you get in and it feels a little bit tight around the top of your head, but it's not something that really causes too much problems. I can see out pretty well. The A posts, B posts are all small, and there's a ton of glass behind me, so visibility is absolutely fine. There we go, overdrive off again because we're going to corners. Overdrive works, of course it does, it's a Volvo. It feels like a proper little rally car. It's got a steering box rather than uh, the later type. But even so, even without that assistance, you're still feeling fairly connected to the road. And you can happily chuck it through a bunch of corners and it, but well, the modified suspension certainly helps. I mentioned previously, this is uh, the first internationally successful Volvo. And they sold about 73,000 of them around the world. And they've built them around the world as well. As you may be surprised to learn that this is not a truly solo Swedish operation building these things. Originally, they first came out of Gothenburg and later on the Torslander factory, also in Sweden. But to get around, or to, to get up to the production they wanted, they also assembled them and built them in Durban in South Africa, in Chile, and later on in Halifax in Canada. In fact, 
the North American market. They initially, they weren't building them there. They were importing them and doing final assembly and finishing touches. And they were coming over with radial tires. But radial tires hadn't been approved for use in North America. So they were having to put <laughs> the old-fashioned cross plies on brand new cars. I don't know if they were throwing the old... Uh, unused radials away or shipping them back to the factory or what but well, that's just a mad retrograde step now this gear shift is another thing which is a bit early Range Rover like it's a massively long wand vanishing under the dashboard somewhere but for all its sort of long unwieldiness it's actually not hard to navigate your way through the four speed at all I'm really also enjoying the fact that it's got those twin air filters on it that give it a real lovely raughty sound in drop a gear. Hang on, I'm gonna go into the back of a Renault Capture if I do it too quickly. Doesn't that sound good? Now, as you might be able to see, I am hoofing along this back road and having a whale of a time. This car is so involving, so much fun and so sure-footed. I'm not doing massive speed, I'm doing between 40 and 50 most of the way, but it feels like I'm absolutely barreling along. The brakes are sharp, it turns in well, it grips, it's rear-wheel drives, it pushes out to the corner. 45 miles an hour feels like if we're in a McLaren we need to be doing 120 to get the same kind of grin factor. And I could have a Labrador and a chest of drawers in the boot at the same time. I've got to say this car is a big piece of me. I only really got into Volvos a year ago when I bought my 740 but this is you can see where it's all come from in a, in a funny sort of way. This was replaced by the 140, and the 140 was replaced by the 200, and the 200 was replaced, not really, by the 700. But this drive's just so lively. This really does feel like a rally car. It's just so willing and engaging. It's a brilliant car to drive. Way more of a driver's car than you would ever expect to look at the thing. does have everything going for it. It's In this modified form it's fairly rapid, it handles well, it's got good space and it's comfortable. What, what's not to love? Well thanks for joining me on the road with this fantastic Volvo P220. Yeah, the Amazon Estate, it's not a car you see that often. Even though they've built an awful lot of them. And that's a shame because it's a great looking car which is so practical, so useful. And as we've seen today with these, a few small upgrades, so drivable. A real genuine everyday driver classic. If you've enjoyed this video, please do hit like and subscribe as always. Hit the bell notification. And join me again next time when I'll be driving something completely different.